According to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. On today's edition of Origins, a fascinating discussion of the human hair. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. We have with us today a great guest, one with incredible experience and knowledge. Dr. Menton, I just want to reaffirm what a tremendous privilege it is to have you here as our guest. Thank you, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. I've heard the terms used hard science and soft science, and hard science is verifiable facts. That's real science. Yeah, I think the, the, the word of choice here would be empirical science. Okay. The three requirements of empirical science is that whatever you're studying, the object or phenomena, be observable. You can't see electrons, but you can see the effects of electrons. Right. They can be measured as voltage. Uh, repeatability is important. Uh, if something is not uh, repeatable, uh, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. After all, history is not repeatable, is it? Right. Never be another Second World War, thank the Lord. Uh, lots of wars, perhaps, but not the Second World War. But it's in the area of so-called prehistorical science that I think uh, we get about most of the speculations that we talk about in the context of evolution. Uh, it's very easy uh, to study how the heart beats, uh, to see how it's paced and manages to keep up, uh, how the muscles contract. But when we ask the question, how did we come to get hearts in the first place? <laughs> then we leave the realm of empirical science and we get into that area of so-called historical science where uh, really there's no way to come to a final conclusion on anything. Well, let's talk about hair. Uh, we're, we're not talking about the musical hair. We're no. talking about the, the hair that's on our bodies. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating subject. Uh, as I go around speaking, I think people are perhaps as interested in hair as they are in anything in the body and uh, on the picture before us right now on the screen we see uh, a hair. In fact, this is a hair that I pulled out of my own scalp several years ago when I could afford this sort of thing. That, that was one of your <laughs> hairs? Yes. Wow. In fact, now that I notice it, uh, uh, I think, Don, maybe you should be giving this lecture since you're the one that has all of the hair intact and I'm the one that's kind of losing it, so they might wonder, what do I know about well, hair? Well, I sense a little regret that you've <laughs> lost that one. Maybe. Yeah, that one never came back. <laughs> uh, but when we look at that hair, we, we, you know, I think sometimes you'd ask the question, how complicated can a hair be? Right. And a hair is just simply beyond our ability to even grasp or understand. One hair. Uh, let's just take a look at that hair now. Right. You'll notice that on the surface of the hair we have a cuticle. It looks like shingles on the roof of a house. And uh, we can mark off some of these cuticles. You can uh, see them here and here and here as we go down the line. Okay. And uh, 
It's those cuticles that make a hair shirt itch. You hear the expression, he's wearing a hair shirt. <laughs> yes. That's why wool sweaters itch. Yes. Little cuticle cells are kind of digging into the and skin. And notice as the hair, uh, it wraps around in a great circle here so that the tip crosses the hair and it gets narrower as we get to the end. So it comes to a real fine point. So this particular hair hadn't been cut. If it would, it would have looked truncated. The interesting thing is what is the function of that cuticle? We know it itches. But what does it do? And the intriguing thing is that one thing the cuticle does is to hold the hair together. It sort of wraps around the hair because inside the hair, uh, the cells are like sticks, a bundle of sticks. And if the cuticle breaks off, the sticks separate. And that's a split end or a split so hair. So when you see splits, that's actually not one hair coming apart, but there are various shafts within the cuticle. Well, no, it's all one hair coming apart, but inside that one hair are sort of stick-like dead cells that, Is that right? are packed together. Uh, another important function of that cuticle is that it keeps the hair from snarling. Uh -huh. See, when one hair turns on another one, they sort of lock horns, right. cuticle. If our hair was made of, say, monofilament nylon, can you imagine that, like a light spin casting uh, fish line? <laughs> if our hair was made out of monofilament nylon and it was, say, 10, 12 inches long and somebody just kind of did this to our head, <laughs> you would never get it unsnarled. You'd just break out the scissors and cut it off. But I can thanks testify to not getting that unsnarled. <laughs> thanks to the cuticle, <laughs> you, you can unsnarl it. Okay. And. Uh, to me, that's just by itself one of, one of the most incredible things. There are companies that buy human hair to make wigs. And people just cut it off and put it in bags and send it in. Now, in order for the wig to lay properly, all the hairs have to face the same way. But people have just thrown hair in the bag. It's possible by taking advantage of the cuticle to sort of card this hair out and get every single hair facing the same way without having to look at each one and get it oriented. Finally, the most important reason for that cuticle is that cuticle locks the hair down in your scalp. If it wouldn't be for that, the hair would just pull out very easily. In fact, mammals would quickly lose their hair and probably be the end of them. We wouldn't have any mammals. But it locks in the hair follicle like a ratchet. And that's kind of one of the stories that uh, I'll be sharing with you. But before we get into those details, let's just kind of look at the different types of hairs that we have. Uh, we uh, have basically three kinds of hairs. Oh. And as we look at the uh, young lady here, we can see the hair that uh, uh, is a kind of an attractive brown there, in fact, very attractive. And those hairs are big enough to see. And we call that kind of a hair a terminal hair. That's the kind we all like, at least on our scalps, keep as long as we can. It's long, you can see it, and it has some pigment to it. It could be black, brown, whatever. Uh, another type of hair is the type of hair uh, that is right on her face right here. And even on her nose and up here on her forehead, you think, well, we don't have hair there, but we do. We have as many hairs on our nose and our forehead per square inch as we do on our scalp. You have hair everywhere? Is that what you're saying? Everywhere on the body, we have hair except for the palms and the foot pads, the thick skin. Okay. Uh, so terminal hairs are the big ones that we can see quite nicely. The next type of hair that we have is the vellus hair, and that is the kind that's on the face and the nose and the, the forehead. These hairs are so tiny, they're almost impossible to see, although if you get the light just right, you see a little sparkle maybe along uh -huh. the forehead and the nose. Uh, the hairs are tiny, they are colorless. So no matter what color your scalp hair is, the terminal hairs, these hairs are always colorless. And then one final thing that's kind of neat about them, although they're the littlest hairs in the body, they have the biggest oil glands. Oh, really? So if you notice skin that appears not to be haired, that's where we know now there are vellus hairs, also is the oily skin on the body, on the nose, on the forehead. And uh, so that, that's two hairs that we all have. There's a third type of hair that we ought to give some thought to, and in some ways this is the most interesting. It's called a lanugo hair. When a baby is in the womb developing, about two, three months before birth, the first hairs are produced. These hairs will not be produced unless nerves have grown out from the spinal cord that come into the skin, and there must be an association of a particular nerve with a particular hair. And when they're together, it produces this vellus hair. You can think of it as kind of the place marker. 
the, the first hair to be made and formed in association with the nerve because hairs are sort of like little levers uh, and uh, when we move them, uh, we, we can feel because of the nerves attached. If you so think, every hair has a nerve? Every single hair, even the little vellus hairs. Yeah. And of course mammals that are covered with hair, like a bear or a dog, they're basically feeling through these hairs. So it's, if they didn't have nerves hooked up to them, it'd be like wearing a fur coat. They wouldn't feel anything. Even the little vellus hairs of our face, and our, uh, when the wind blows by and catches you these hairs, yes. you feel a freshness of the wind mm -hmm. blowing by. Now, do we absolutely have to have such hairs? No, but isn't it nice to feel the freshness? The yeah. Lord thinks of such little things. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, well, uh, let's look at a Lanugo hair. I just happen to have a, a wonderful grandson who was uh, born premature. And uh, there's a picture of him right there. Uh, he was about two months premature. A little fellow, I could almost get my ring on his wrist. And you can see these wonderful Lanugo hairs, which are those first place marker hairs. Of course, you can imagine evolutionists have fun with this one. They say, well, there you go. You see, that's the ape stage. You get the hair all over the body. But as they say, biologically, we know what they are. They are the first established place marker hair that forms an association with a nerve. With no nerves, no hair, no hair, no nerves to this area. Well, now let's get into the detail of just what makes a hair. And for right. that, I think I'll just go up to our board. Show us what you got, my board. friend. Hair grows in a cyclic way. We call it the hair cycle. Uh, this is the growing phase. And the hair grows 3 tenths of a millimeter a day. Thickness of a dime is a millimeter. Think of 3 tenths the thickness of a dime. Every day your hair grows that much. And it just keeps growing that rate. If you pull on it, it doesn't grow any faster. We don't know of anything that makes it go faster or slower. Does it everybody's just, hair grow about the same rate? About the same rate, 3 tenths of a millimeter a day. Okay. And it grows and it grows and it grows for some period of time, depending on which hair in the body. And then it goes into a so-called resting phase. What happens there is it quits producing new hair. All the hair is made down here in the bottom. These cells die and then it slides right out, sort of like toothpaste coming out of a tube, except the toothpaste gets hard. And when it goes into the resting stage, it sort of quits making this hair and the hair follicle shortens up. And then little anchoring guy wires are produced that go out into the follicle that anchor this resting hair in so that it's really harder to pull out than one of these growing hairs. Huh. And finally, after going through the so-called resting stage for about a month or so, or a few weeks, a new hair is produced. Now this is important. We do not start adding more hair onto the old one. The old one is kicked out of the nest and the new one down here is growing in behind it. Have you noticed, Don, um, when you uh, wash your hair in the sink, you sometimes see hairs in the sink. I have good news and bad news for anyone that sees hairs in the sink. The good news is that hair in the sink is one of these hairs that's fallen out because a new one is growing in behind it. Isn't that pretty good? That is too. The, the, the you cannot news. get the hair in the sink new unless hope. a new one has pushed it out. Okay. You figure, what could be the bad news here? <laughs> the bad news is that the new one growing in behind, and just from one cycle to the next, could be a vellus hair. Uh -huh. And so that's what male pattern baldness is all about. At some point in life, a nice terminal hair falls out, we've been pretty proud of, and in its place, a little vellus hair grows in. And so you never lose a hair in your whole lifetime. In fact, when you're born, you have all the hairs you're ever going to have. The same number. That's right. They just kind of move apart a little bit further as you get older and the skin surface gets bigger. And whether you pull a hair out or it falls out, if you pull it out, a new one just starts growing right away. And so you never lose any hairs unless you're to have a deep abrasion that went way under all of these hairs. And uh, this cycle just keeps going over and over again. Now how long a hair gets depends on how long this growth period is up here. <laughs> here is a cell that, uh, or a hair that's growing. Uh, down in the skin, uh, the cells quickly die, and if this grows for, say, uh, 10 years, 10 or 11 years, you have two feet or more of hair. If all of us were to sort of form some sort of a special uh, club where we decide we're not cutting our hair, and we get together 10 years from now to see how things are going, some of us would have hair to our shoulder, some of us would have hair to maybe mid-back and others maybe all the way down to uh, the base of the spine. 
And uh, that would simply reflect how long the hair growth cycle is. Huh. Longer hair growth cycle, uh, it would grow uh, for a longer period of time. This is the way the hair follicle looks inside. It's really pretty complicated. All of the cell division is occurring right here. And as the cells divide, they move up in seven concentric cylinders, one inside of the other, target fashion. And the inner parts form the hair. This is the hair right in here, in this area. And then out here is the wall of the hair follicle. And uh, so the hair is sliding out of the follicle. Uh, living cells become dead cells, and that makes this dead thread. The problem is, what keeps this thread from just being pulled right out of the follicle? Because if you get a hold of the hair, this is soft down here, it should come out. Well, that's where this locking mechanism uh, comes in. Here is a hair growing in the follicle, living cells from here to here, and from this point up, dead. They just die that fast. The wall of the follicle should be right down here tight against the hair. Uh, it's an artifact that it's pulled away here because this is a section. But if that's down tight, notice that there is a lining layer right here. Have it over here. And that's called the inner root sheath of the hair follicle. This is a dead layer piled up right close against the hair in life, and it locks the hair in. Let me just uh, stop sure. you there for a minute. Don't you go away. We're in the middle of a fascinating discussion about the intricacy and the complexity of our hair and how it reflects the glory of our God. We'll be back in a minute and you stay with us. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Voyager Space Probe, an amazing discovery. In 1979, the Voyager Space Probe filmed a volcano erupting on Io, one of Jupiter's moons. This discovery amazed the NASA scientists who believe in the evolutionary concept that the solar system is billions of years old. Small bodies like this moon should have cooled off long ago. The fact that Io still has volcanic activity when it is supposedly almost 5 billion years old has no adequate explanation. Perhaps Io is still hot because it is not very old. Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you are interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, P.O. Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky. 41048 or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org We're back and I'm here with Dr. David Menton and we're talking about hair and Dr. Menton was just explaining to us what holds our hairs inside our head so take it from there and do that for us my friend. Okay let's blow it up with the microscope here and uh, here it is at uh, higher power. We can see that very point where the cells are suddenly dying. See, this cell's alive as a nucleus. Up here, the cells are all dead. On the very surface, there's this cuticle, and you can barely make it out, except we have this kind of shingle-like pattern uh, going all up on both sides. And that interlocks with a shingle-like pattern that is on the cuticle that lines the hair follicle. So these two are going to interlock together to bind the hair in the follicle. Let's just see how that uh, looks. We'll take an area like that and magnify it. Hmm. Look Turn at it this. over. <laughs> so you can see. The tip of the hair is to our right, uh, maybe a quarter of a mile or so at this magnification. Uh, on the surface of the hair, you can see it right here. The cuticle, the free edges are facing to the right. But lining the hair follicle is this dead layer. The thickness is from here to here. And if you look very carefully, there is a cuticle lining the hair follicle that is running the opposite direction of the hair. Isn't that amazing? The two interlock like a ratchet. Right. So let's just see how this all plays out. In the drawing on the left, we get kind of a uh, cartoon way of looking at how this works. 
Here is the hair with the cuticle cells on the surface. They overlap like shingles, about five, six of them overlapping deep. Uh, the free edges are pointing up, but lining the follicle right in here is the cuticle of the follicle, and their free edges are pointing down. The two interlock, and here we can actually see it in a hair follicle. What I did here was to pull a hair follicle out of the scalp. When you do this, when it's growing and it's locked in, it pulls two-thirds of the hair follicle with it. When you pull a hair out, you can kind of feel there's a knob on the end. That's yes. two-thirds of your hair follicle. Okay. Uh, it comes along because it was locked in there. It had to come with it. Okay. Now, don't worry about it. It'll rebuild a new follicle for you and start making a new hair right away. <laughs> but uh, let's just look at this at higher power. After pulling the follicle out, I dried the hair follicle. Then I took a broken piece of razor blade and gave it a kind of a karate chop. The follicle broke open, and now we can look down inside the follicle and at the hair exposed that used to be inside the follicle. We can see the cuticle cells here on the hair, but notice we have cuticle cells lining the follicle as well. Right. And that's what locks together. the hair in the follicle. Let's see this at higher magnification yet. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, a hugely magnified hair. The tip is in the direction of the arrow. We have just the innermost layer of the root sheath, the dead layer, the cuticle of the root sheath that's still in, attached. And you can see how closely the two fit there. Look at those little hooks holding yeah, it together. Yeah, there's there. a little step right, right here, see? Right. Another one here Perfectly down the line. Give you together. an idea of the magnification here. This is a red blood cell right in there in the circle. Wow. So this is really pumped up there. <laughs> now, if we get a hold of the edge of the cuticle and we pull it away of the inner root sheath, this is what you see. And every little groove and Amazing. bump on the cuticle of the hair is mirrored by the lining of the follicle. Now, if you're thinking about this, we have a problem on our hands. We've solved one problem, that is to keep the hair from being pulled out so easily, without which mammals probably wouldn't have survived. But how does it grow? It's supposed to come out of the follicle three-tenths of a millimeter a day, just growing, 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 but it's locked in. In fact, we know if we just pull it, we pull the follicle out with the hair, two-thirds of it anyway. Oh, that's a fascinating story. Let's just look at what happens here. What you see in red is that interlocking cuticle. They're between the red and the black, that's the cuticle of the inner root sheath locking to the cuticle of the hair. So if we pull in the hair, it doesn't want to come out, it's locked in. The only way the hair can grow, and this is just so amazing, is that the inner root sheath actually needs to slide up with the hair. So as the hair grows out of the follicle, the red tube that's around it there has to move up with it. So the slippage is not between the hair and the follicle, but between the dead layer of the lining of the follicle and the living part of the follicle out in here. And you think, well, how does that move? There are little buttons that uh, can uh, button and unbutton very quickly. And thousands and thousands and thousands of these little buttons, buttoning, unbuttoning, allow this locking layer to migrate under control up with the hair. Now, if you're thinking, we get up to the surface here, does the hair emerge with like a mailing tube around it then? Ah, uh, no, because right here are special enzymes that are produced that destroy the lock so that the hair can emerge without the lock around it. You know, it's no wonder that our Lord says in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 to 31, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And remember, the Lord doesn't have to change the count because you're born with all the hairs you're ever going to have. The, the kind very of hair changes, the number never does. That's right. It can change from one quality to another, terminal, vellus, lanugo, but the numbers don't change. The very hairs of her head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. Come on down here and talk to me, Dr. Minton. What does it mean to know that God uses our hair to tell us of our worth? Well, the Lord tries to communicate to us the, the level of care uh, that he has for us. And uh, when we understand that he even knows the number of hairs in our head, uh, then certainly he knows the more important things sure about our life. It's been great having you with us today. 
You know, I think that these shows that we have done with Dr. Minton are just a tremendous testimony to the, to the glory and work of God in our lives. And I just hope that it helps you to remember that, you know, it's God's view that He made you. And that should be your worldview, too. And so until next time, may God bless you. It's been good having you with us, friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 711 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 711, Cornerstone Television, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.